we will begin the technical uh, part of the event. Our first presenter is Donna, Donna Sandu of the German Aerospace Center, DLR. She will be talking to us about real-time hardware in the loop test configuration use case for the fine guidance system of Plato. Donna. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. So hi, everyone. My name is Donna Sandu, and I work as a software verification engineer for the German Aerospace Center. And I'm very happy to be joining the workshop as a presenter today to share with you the work we do on Plato. So we already had a presentation on Plato on day two of the workshops. In case you've missed it, uh, do make sure that you check out the recording. It's uh, entitled Mastering the Plato Onboard Data Processing Complexity. But today I'm going to be focusing on testing one of the subsystems of Plato. So on behalf of the team, I'm going to tell you about our real-time hardware in the loop test configuration for the verification of the fine guidance system of Plato. As an outline, I'm going to begin by giving you the context behind the presentation and a brief description of the mission, an overview of the data processing system on board and the fine guidance system. And then I would like to address three main topics uh, during today's presentation. The first one being the hardware in the loop test configuration for the verification of the fine guidance system then the corresponding test automation environment and the relevant technologies behind that. And last but not least, the test data archiving tool implementation. And I will um, finalize by wrapping up the presentation. So let's begin. Um, since all of you are working in the space industry, you are very familiar with the high quality standards and the extremely strict requirements that all onboard software satellite applications are subject to. And that in order to prove that these requirements of increasingly complex software systems are met, extensive testing is needed. This is an artist's impression of the Plato spacecraft. Um, it has a very complex payload data processing system. And at the German Aerospace Center, we are responsible for the functional verification of this data processing system. So given uh, its complexity, we want to ensure that we start testing early. So we want to start testing already in the development phase such that we can find and fix bugs early on and such that we can uh, essentially gain the confidence that we are going to meet the science requirements. So this presentation is then going to be about the challenges of the on-ground verification of a complex uh, onboard data processing system. To give you a bit of an overview of the mission, PLATO stands for Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars. It's a ESA medium class mission in the Cosmic Vision Program, so it's a long-term scientific project. And its main goal is the detection and characterization of Earth-like exoplanets in habitable zones or solar type stars. And in order to achieve this, we need long, uninterrupted, ultra high precision photometric monitoring of the sky from which we can uh, deduce light curves. So uh, the diagram on the left shows you how a planetary transit is detected. So we have the stellar flux intensity over time. And when a planet passes in front of its star, it produces a dip in the luminosity of the star. And this is how scientists can use light curves in order to detect the planetary transits. So there's a lot of super exciting science going on around Plato, but what I would like to point out from an engineering perspective is that the novelty of this mission in comparison to its predecessors is that it introduces a multi-camera approach. So we have a total of 24 so-called normal cameras on board. They operate at a nominal cadence of 25 seconds and are mainly operated for science observation. And we have two additional fast cameras on board, fast because they operate at a shorter cadence of 2.5 seconds, and they monitor brighter stars, which are used as guide stars by the fine pointing mechanism of the spacecraft. I am now going to give you a um, overview of the data processing system and the fine guidance system. Um, so the payload data processing system or short DPS consists of an instrument control unit, the normal data processing units and fast data processing units. And all units are connected in a space wire network. 
the instrument control unit is responsible for managing the entire payload. So it manages the spaceware network, the communication to the data processing units, the interface to the service module, and it is also responsible for the compression of science data products before these are sent to the service module. In the top left hand side corner, you can see we have 24 normal cameras and a total of 12 normal data processing units. So this means each normal data processing unit is connected to two normal camera front end electronics. And the main responsibility of the normal data processing unit is to perform um, sort of pre-processing of the image data before this is sent to the instrument control unit. So a typical science data product, which is of relevance for this talk, is um, what we call imagets. These are image cutouts, so small images around stars of interest. Then on the bottom left hand side corner, we see we have the, the fast change chain, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on in the following. So we have two fast cameras and two fast data processing units. So each fast data processing unit is connected to one uh, fast camera. And similarly as the normal data processing units, the fast GPUs are also responsible for a pre-processing of image data uh, before this is sent to the ICU. And additionally, we have the fine guidance system that runs on the fast GPU. So I have said earlier that the fast cameras monitor brighter stars, which are used as guide stars by the fine guidance system to produce fine guidance data, which can be fed directly into the AOCS of the spacecraft. So what the fine guidance system does in uh, very, very simple terms is that it's comparing where the spacecraft is pointing to where it's supposed to be pointing. And it's, uh, it computes a um, error in uh, attitude, which it sends to the spacecraft. And it does this uh, in less simple terms by comparing the um, position in the image frame of a tracked bright star to the known position of that star from a star catalog. So given a set of bright stars that we use as input for the fine guidance system, um, we compute a list of window positions on the image frame on the sensor. And these windows are then read out. So we obtain these small images that uh, contain uh, stars. So each small image contains one star. For each of these images, the algorithm then computes the star center of brightness, also called a centroid. And then from this centroid, it computes a so-called star direction vector. And the algorithm needs at least two star direction vectors to compute the attitude of a telescope by means of a quaternion estimator algorithm. So this is a mission critical component because we rely on a very precise positioning of the satellite in order to ensure that we are going to uh, achieve the science requirements. In terms of verification of the fine guidance system, the challenge is that it is not possible and not feasible to execute all possible test cases for its verification. So this would mean all possible bright target stars and their combination. So our goal is to automatically and systematically select those test cases that cause mission critical behavior. And we have a twofold solution for this. The first step is a partitioning approach, which is used to reduce the number of test cases and to compute the coverage of the test suite against the input domain of the fine guidance system. And the second step is a genetic algorithm, which automatically selects those test cases that cause a mission critical behavior from this reduced test suite. I invite you to have a look at the published papers we have written on uh, this topic if you're interested in more details. So now I'm going to get to the first of the three main topics that I wanted to tell you about today, and this is the hardware in the loop test configuration. I have mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we want to start testing early. Um, now, when you have a look at this figure in the middle of the slide, you see the Plato spacecraft is composed out of the service module and the payload module. And the payload module itself is also composed out of the optical bench and the electronics panel on which the data processing system units reside. 
So when we perform tests at data processing system level, we do not have the availability of the cameras or of the service module. So we will need to simulate the interfaces to these. And another very important aspect that we need to take into consideration for the verification of the FGS is that we are not able to optically stimulate the cameras on ground in a representative way for the verification of the FGS of the fine guidance system. So this means we cannot simulate this set of bright stars to be used as guide stars by the fine guidance system. So this means we need to simulate the sky, we need to simulate camera effects, we simulate the interfaces to the camera and to the spacecraft. And in order to verify the real time behavior, we have the real payload units in the loop. So you see on the right hand side in the diagram, we have the fast data processing unit, it's connected to the instrument control unit and also directly to a spacecraft interface simulator. There is another electronic unit I haven't mentioned so far, but in this context, its main responsibility is the generation of hardware synchronization pools, which is distributed. Then coming to the ground support equipment, we first of all have on the left hand side, a spacecraft interface simulator. And this is, as its name suggests, only an, a simulator of the interface to the spacecraft, because we do not have a simulation of the onboard computer. It is nonetheless treated as the central node for command and controlling, and it is based on the commercial tool TSC or test sequence controller. In the middle of the diagram, we have what I have labeled camera data stream simulator. And this is in fact a set of two ground support equipment. We have on one hand, the image generator, which is a simulator of data coming from a fast camera. And then on the other hand, we have a front end electronics emulator, which is a simulator of the data stream that would come out of a real front end electronics. So in order to imagine the data flow that um, happens during a test run, we start with a um, initial attitude. So an initial orientation that we feed from the spacecraft interface to simulator to the image generator. So we are telling the image generator where we are supposedly pointing to. With this information and with a star catalog and a list of uh, window positions, uh, the image generator then simulates 30 of these small images containing simulated bright stars. These are then fed to the front end electronics emulator, the packets are sent to the fast uh, data processing unit, and then the fine guidance system computes the error in attitude and sends this information to the ICU and also directly to the spacecraft interface simulator. Um, so this is a technically open loop scenario, because as I said, we do not have a simulation of the onboard computer. And our real time requirement is to complete one of these loop uh, one of these loops within 2.5 seconds. And this is a very short time in case you were wondering. So what happens uh, within these 2.5 seconds? In the real system, we have the integration of the CCD being performed for about 2.3 seconds. Then on reception of the hardware synchronization pulse, uh, the frame transfer is triggered. So this means the data is transferred from the uncovered half of the CCD to the covered half of the CCD. Then the CCDs are read out and the images are sent to the fast data processing unit. And then the um, fine guidance system computes the uh, error in attitude, which it sends to the AOCS of the spacecraft. Now in a simulated system, we need to um, make up for the fact that we, we cannot stimulate the cameras on ground. So I'm going to try to explain what happens in this uh, synchronization diagram. So we start uh, with the input from the spacecraft interface simulator. So we have a constant input of attitude information. So we have a time series of quaternions being sent from the spacecraft interface simulator to the image generator at a frequency of eight Hertz. Then on reception of a hardware synchronization pulse, the so-called frame transfer is triggered, which in the simulated environment means that we trigger the start of the calculation of these simulated small images. So these images containing simulated stars are uh, transferred to the front end electronics emulator, which 
copies the data around and packetizes the information and sends the data stream to the fast data processing unit where the fine guidance system computes the fine guidance system data so the error quaternions which are then fed back to the spacecraft interface simulator and then on reception of the next hardware synchronization pulls the cycle is repeated and this is our um, cycle of 2.5 seconds so now that um, you know what, what we are actually testing, I'm, I'm getting to the second um, topic of the three that I wanted to address. Uh, we want to ensure repeatability of our tests. So this is why we have put in place a test automation environment that I'm going to describe to you in the following. We start with a lab computer. So um, this computer can be seen as the spacecraft interface simulator you've seen in the previous slides, or it can be an ICU interface simulator. Um, this run computer runs Docker, which allows us to easily upgrade the system because maintaining all containers uh, makes sure that we always have a running system. Docker runs Jenkins for automation and Sonar Cube for quality control. In order to access the system, we can either uh, use a remote desktop connection or we, via Nginx, we have the possibility of easily accessing our test automation so, uh, software via web interfaces with host files. For versioning control, uh, we use GitLab where we store the Jenkins pipeline, we store the test scripts and we store any other tools uh, that we need, such as tools for remotely power cycling the unit under test, or tools for uh, generating images out of captured uh, raw data. Then we have TSC, or the Test Sequence Controller. This is this uh, commercial tool that's also at the um, base of the spacecraft interface simulator. Uh, you've seen this in one of the previous slides. So we write our uh, scripts, our tickled scripts for TSC, and based on the pipeline file, we can execute these scripts um, nightly or on weekends or on, on changes, uh, depending on what we've specified. We also have a data archiver tool sitting between uh, TSC and the unit under test, and I will go into more details uh, in one of the later slides. Um, we have a remote power switch, which was, first of all, a great investment for uh, working uh, from home, but also it provided the possibility of us uh, remotely power cycling the unit under test after every test run, such that we ensure that there is no interdependency between uh, the tests. And then we have all the test artifacts. Um, the great thing is that everything that we need and is generated as a result of these test runs is automatically stored in the computer. Uh, speaking of test artifacts, my favorite part of uh, this environment is the concept that we use of a single source of truth. So we treat the test scripts as the single source of truth, which means our focus is to mainly maintain the test scripts as the, the main test documents. So these uh, scripts have headers which contain meta information on uh, the test environment, the re requirements which are being tested, the preconditions, etc. And depending on the mode in which we execute a test script, we can either generate a test procedure or we can generate a test report. We also have Python scripts, which we use to automatically generate a verification control matrix against the system specification or a TMTC database coverage matrix. Um, I'm getting now to the third of the three points I wanted to tell you about, this is the test data archiving tool. So I have mentioned we have this data archiver between TSC and the unit under test. And what this is, it's a, it's a Java app. It's essentially an ethernet sniffer, which captures the traffic between the TSC and the unit under test. Um, it also encodes this information in Kafka messages which are then stored in a Cassandra database. Another great feature of this Ethernet sniffer is that it performs data interpretation and calibration. So uh, given a TMTC database, so we can both store interpreted and calibrated data in the Cassandra database, but also raw data. 
And another great feature of this app is that it um, enriches the data stream with meta information such as test ID, interface ID, or git commit hashes of the test scripts or of the database, which makes it easier for us to trace back the uh, data after a given test run. And in order to access the database, we use Jupyter Notebooks with the PySpark API to access Spark to access Cassandra. And this brings me to the summary. And uh, I will now wrap up. Um, our challenge is the on-ground verification of a complex image or data processing algorithm. Um, the need of uh, starting testing early um, given the unavailability of units has led to the um, use of these simulators. So I've presented to you our hardware in the loop uh, test configuration. We want to ensure uh, reproducibility of our tests. So we have set up a test automation environment. Uh, we have this concept of a single source of truth. So we aim at mainly uh, maintaining the test scripts from which we generate all the other required uh, test artifacts. And in order to um, go back to test data at any time after a test has been run, uh, we have uh, implemented a data archiving tool. So what I would like you to take away from this presentation is that while I have presented uh, all of these technologies and concepts in the context of Plato. These are technologies and concept concepts which are deployable in other projects. So perhaps you uh, have found similarities to your projects or perhaps you found something interesting that you would like to try out. In any case, I'd be very happy to hear your feedback and to hear if you have any uh, suggestions for improvement even. So this brings me to the end of the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, so we have a minute or two for some questions. If folks want to get them in the Q&A, we'll hang out for just a minute and see, see what streams in. Um, and also, I think some of this um, overlaps with maybe some of the conversations happening in the DevOps channel. So um, I don't know if, Donna, you want to take a look at that. And uh, maybe there's some contributions you can make over there mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I'm happy to be answering the questions also on Slack. Um, I'm going to check out the DevOps channel. I don't think I'm in the DevOps channel. Uh, okay, I think you can, you have the power to join that. Yes, I'm going to join, uh, I'm going to join the channel. And in any case, if you have any questions, just uh, let me know. I can answer them on Slack as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Donna. Excellent presentation. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much.